Okay, so this is where it starts. Let me introduce Chelsea. So um, we'll just do a little welcome, everyone. And we are going to be introducing our first powerful speaker all the way from Utah. He is the owner, Jason Lattice, the owner of Quantum Body Human Performance Coaching and Buddha Gear. He's been a quantum wellness coach for over 30 years. He's here to share tips on how parents can overcome their limiting beliefs and the powerful impact that their expectations directly affect their children's confidence. I love how we share the same passion on neuroplasticity, which I'm sure you can share in a, just in a little mini um, clip and will give parents hope that with persistence and practice, anything is possible. So Jason, why do we do what we do? Why do we say what we say? And how can parents save their sanity? Oh my gosh, that's a huge question to answer <laughs> 10 minutes. But here we go, are you ready? Buckle up. Um, first, thank you, Karen. Thank you for having me. Deslin, you're amazing. Thank you for getting all this together. Um, I love all you guys and I really appreciate you. First, huge shout out to all the parents both planned and unplanned parents, it's the hardest job you'll ever love. Um, and I see you guys nodding and agreeing because it's amazing, guys. It's uh, with my clients, um, they tend to make things challenging and they come to me with questions. How do I make this easier? Long time. Uh, yeah. What's that? Dukes, right? Yeah. Oh, no, no, I just want to make sure you can hear me. Um, but we overstudy for over prepare for so many things. We overstudy for things. Um, we go to school, we get a degree for a career, all this over preparation for everything. But at what point did us did us as parents did we say, hey, I've got a great idea. Let's make a human from scratch and then let's raise it. You know what I mean? We never thought about this. We just jumped in and like I said, we'll get a degree for our career. But yet, as a parent, we tend to just jump in. Or for some of them, it's it's a surprise, which is awesome. Um, but we don't prepare for it. We think, oh, my gosh, I was a kid. I did fine. As long as I keep a roof over their head and keep them well fed and send them to school, everything will turn out all right. Well, it's interesting. And it, it always does. But we tend not to prepare for that as much. And you were, Karen, you were mentioning, you know, why we do what we do and i've got a video called why we do what we do that i actually have most of my clients listen to before i work with them but it clears a lot of the pathway so i don't have to spend hours explaining these things to them but honestly i ask my clients all the time in our first meeting who are you you know and they they give me these labels you know i'm a i'm a doctor i'm a lawyer i do this for a living this is my my religion my whatever I do, that's not you at all. That's not you. Um, and that's really where I'm going with this is how can you raise another human if you don't really know and are secure with who you are? And so sometimes it takes a little inner work before you do that outer work, because I find a lot of parents are doing just as much parenting of that inner child for themselves while they're trying to parent that other child in front of them. And so with a little bit of reflection, um, hopefully I can help you guys out. Um, it's what I call really your domestication process, how we were all raised, the good boy, good girl syndrome. We'll do anything to please that adult that's raising us. And I use the word caregiver a lot because it's not always just the, the parents, because for me, both my parents worked. So I came home, it was my big brother who raised me, which was good and bad. But um, we got to remember that it's our children are growing up trying to please their caregivers. And just that alone will change the way you phrase things when you work with your children. Um, but I want to digress a little bit further and kind of go back to a lot of those unconscious habits that you have that you developed from your parents or your brother or your caregiver or your teacher and these habits that we've developed and we say, oh my gosh, every time I get triggered, why do we respond that way? Well, these are the programs that were actually written 
not in our conscious mind up here in our rational conscious reasoning mind. They're written down here in the subconscious. So in about five minutes, I'm going to take you on a really quick tour of neural programming. And when we decide to have a baby and it starts forming in mom's belly, I'm rubbing my belly here. Um, it's as your brain develops, it's in a sleeping delta, low delta brainwave. And anything that happens to mom happens to the baby because when things happen, was mom, does mom feel safe? Does mom feel loved? Does mom feel excited? Whatever, that creates a chemical storm in mom's body, which goes into our bloodstream, which goes into the baby. So the baby is feeling everything around you. When dad walks into the room and mom gets excited, the baby feels that. When someone walks into the room and mom is afraid, the baby feels that. So these are all the things you got to understand is your baby starts forming and building its brain feelings and emotions while it's still in the womb. Once it's born, it's still in that delta brainwave. Babies sleep a lot. They're still in that sleepy delta brainwave. They're actually learning through absorbing energy and emotions. They're not learning from your words. They're feeling, they're feeling the energy, they're feeling what's going on around them. So this is something you got to be super aware of. We have those conversations next to our children and we think, well, they're too young to know what we're saying, but they feel you. They feel the vibrations. They know what's going on. They know if you're happy, if you're safe, if you're afraid, if you're nervous, trust me, they know. But as we get a little older, and I forgot to set my timer, so give me a couple of minutes, Karen, when I, when I only have two or three left. I'm trying to talk fast. Um, our brainwaves, we're going to talk about delta, theta, alpha, beta. We're in a beta brainwave right now. We're adulting. We're thinking. We're navigating the world around us. When you're a child, you go from that delta wave at about two years old-ish. You know, it depends on you and your genetics. We start to bump up to a little higher brainwave which is a theta brainwave. This is a super imaginative brainwave where you could grab that broom and ride it around the house and it was a horse. In your mind, it was a horse. And you grab that stick and it was a sword and your imagination is just amazing. But at this phase, not only is our brain growing at an unfathomable rate, we're having to learn at an unfathomable rate. So we start laying those programs. The challenge is, Children are learning from everyone around them without discernment. Did you catch that? Without discernment. Their frontal lobe is not even formed or online yet. They're just learning. So if you walk up in a really serious manner and tell them something as though it's a fact, if they trust you, they'll believe you. Don't forget that. They'll believe you. And as soon as they believe you and they agree with you, that becomes a truth for them for the rest of their lives until it's challenged or until they change that truth. That's why we still have a lot of programming in our head that was formed as a baby. We listened to everyone, right, wrong, or we didn't know any different. We didn't discern it. We just listened and learned. We got to learn how to, how to adult as fast as possible. Well, as we go through that imaginative super learning phase, we learn from those that we trust. We also learn that those authority figures that we look up to that we're around a lot. So it might not be the parents. It might just be, it might be the teacher. It might be the caregiver. Who knows? It might be the bus driver. They might be learning everything they ever learned from that wonderful bus driver that greets them with a smile every morning. And they learn to love that bus driver. So one of the things I help my parents realize, my parents, <laughs> any clients that are parents is, some of the most important time you can spend with your child is that first 10 to 20 minutes in the morning. How do they wake up? How do you greet them? Do they feel loved? Do they feel safe? Do they feel accepted? Are you telling them, oh my gosh, good morning. It's such a beautiful day. How amazing are you? I'm so excited you're going to school to learn all these great things. I can't wait to hear what you learned today. Or are you stressed out trying to cook eggs because you're going to be late because you slept in 10 minutes? Something to think about. That first 10 minutes means everything. It sets the standard of how their day is going to go. When they come home from school, if you're there, and if you're not, that's okay. My parents weren't. Do you greet them with excitement? And the next super important time is before bed. How do you send them off to bed? 
Is it, oh my gosh, I'm late for, I just got back from a meeting. I just cooked dinner. I got dishes to do. Go brush your teeth and go to bed. Or do you take that moment to be present with your child? Tell them how much you love them, how proud you are of them. Find out a little bit about what they learned today and tell them how excited you are for tomorrow. Because when they go to bed, they're going to drop back down into that theta wave and that delta deep sleep wave where they can reprogram that subconscious pattern that those limiting of beliefs they may have picked up. This is where you can help them learn to understand they're seen, they're loved, they're safe, and they're, sleep and they're going to bed to wake up for another beautiful day because they're going to go to bed and they're going to manifest this next day. <clears throat> you help them prepare for that. So something you want to keep in mind. And then as we, as, as our kids get older, they drop into that daydreaming stage as a teenager where I used to stare out the window in science class and, and daydream that's an alpha state. And that's where in meditation, I can help people get down to that state and rewrite these programs. It's fun. It's really fun. Um, I'd love to talk more about that, but we don't have time. Uh, but from there, from that alpha wave, that's when we, oh my gosh, now we got to get a job. We got to get a car. We need insurance. Um, and we have to start adulting. Jason, you accidentally hit um, mute. Oh, no, I did. Oh, I did. Sorry. Sorry. Muted you oh, back. okay, cool. Sorry, sorry. Um, Can you just repeat that last part? Uh, I, I was just saying, so after we get out of that alpha state, we we start, you know, adulting. We have to get a car, get a job, all of these priorities. That's when our brain waves really speed up to navigating the world around us. And we've already laid that program of really how we're going to live. We've built our truths. Yes, we're still going to learn. But that deep subconscious program, and we keep, you know, you hear all the time, how do I, uh, why do I keep doing these things, all these habits, how do I get rid of them? Well, you're not going to retrain them in this beta brainwave. You need to slow down a little bit. That's another program that we can talk about later. But you got to understand all of those subconscious patterns, or most of them are written as a child. This child you're raising, you're writing programs that they're going to run for the rest of their life. Are they busy? Are they stressed out? Do they not have time for you? Later when they're teens, are they busy? Are they stressed out? Do they not have time for you? Hmm. Where did they learn that? So these are questions you need to ask yourself. Um, rules in my house really are pretty simple. You're loved. You're safe. And you're enough. The rest we can work on later. But that's really the grounding. You loved, you're safe, you're enough. Let your child know that they're amazing. These are the where they're writing that program. If mom was always stressed out and never had time, chances are they're going to become the mom that's always stressed out and never has time because your children don't listen to those prepared speeches that you read to them that you think you're supposed to say as a parent. They model you. So all those subconscious patterns that you're running all day long and you don't even notice it, all these little things that you're doing, guess what? Your kids do. And they're learning from you. So just something to say, pay attention to. Something for just a, a little bit of relief for the parents, the frustrated parents that want to have that nice, reasonable conversation with their children. This big old frontal lobe on the front of our mind here, brain here, it doesn't even come online until you're late in your teens and oftentimes isn't fully active until you're 20 or older. So if you get frustrated that you can't reason with your child, there's a reason for the lack of reasoning, and that's because the frontal lobe's not online yet. So try not to get overly frustrated. They're learning. They're learning to be a person. They're learning to stand on their own feet. They're learning to stand in their power. So make sure you make them feel powerful, wanted, loved, and cared for. Cool. And there you go. Is wow. that my 10 minutes? Yes. Oh my gosh. That was amazing. I think well, we, we get are. to ask you questions and answers. Yes. Oh no. Not <laughs> Not question. <laughs> Anyone have questions or feedback? I know that I listen to Death wake up her son in the morning and she is 
very kind, very mellow. And I didn't realize, I guess when I woke up my girls, I've been reminded now I have a 20 and 26. I was like, okay, come on, we're going to be leaving in an hour. Da, 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 da. And I thought, uh, I didn't even know, Jason, what I was doing. So I'm doing a lot of apologizing. But anyway, None of us did. Oh my gosh. Because you're was... just on this roller coaster of the to-do list. And then you forget to remind your kids that they're learning. I know. I look back at all the things that I thought I was being a great parent. And then I'm like, did I really do that? Oh my gosh. You know, fortunately, through neuroplasticity, our brains are malleable. We can work on this. So even though they are teenagers um, and their frontal lobe isn't fully online, we can slowly start to reprogram these things and re-enter the, <laughs> you're loved, you're safe, you're enough. And the biggest one is, you're enough. You don't have to be just like everybody else on social media. Please don't. Please don't. You know, I don't want uh, Joy and I together uh, in a blended family. We have eight kids. Oh my gosh. I know. And I'm still alive. I got a little twitch right here that I can, but <laughs> um, it's like I said, those rules, you're loved, you're enough, but we don't want eight roses. We want eight individual beautiful flowers. We don't want to raise all our children to be exactly like us or exactly like someone else. We want them to be those unique, beautiful little spirits they were born to be and actually blossom into that flower. Not the flower I think you're supposed to be. Blossom into your own unique flower. You're amazing. And you need to know that. I, I had a question. Um, so like, the past, like, sometimes we can get guilted out as parents, right? Like, oh my gosh, like, you know, and then sometimes we can focus on what our parents didn't do, right? Yeah. And I think it's important for us to heal our wounds and whatnot. But can you give us a simple practical tip for today? <laughs> you know what I mean? If, um, like, even like Karen was talking about reparenting our inner child, um, yeah. is there like a a tip that we can start doing for ourselves because if we cannot like really feel enough as a person and as as an individual it's hard for us to to make our children our spouses or anybody feel enough if we don't feel enough ah there you go that's a great question well um if i were to really narrow it down really quick do more of what you love most people don't take time for ourselves. We're too busy reading all the, I won't use any names, books, motivational speakers, these sorts of things. And then, you know, at the end of the day, we're like, oh my gosh, I just went to the seminar all weekend. I've got to figure it out. And then someone triggers you and you explode. Well, it's because you're so busy trying to be like other people and take care of other people. You're not taking a moment for yourself. And honestly, it's those small moments for yourself in the morning and gosh, I could talk for 10 minutes just on this. I wish I had more time. Um, but when you wake up, you actually wake up in an alpha state. That's that daydreaming state. That's a, a really powerful programming stage. When you wake up in the morning, I've got a really quiet alarm and I can just turn it off. And it's, it's so I basically I'm just barely awake, but not fully awake. That's called alpha. That's an alpha state. That's where you start to program your day. If the first thing you think of is, oh my God, I'm going to be late for work. I'm stressed out. I've got all these things to do. That sets your motion for the day. But if you learn to sit there in that alpha state, relax, deep, breathe deep, tell yourself how amazing you are and think of the things you love and think of three things you really, I mean, more if you want, of course, but that you're in deep gratitude for and how amazing that day is going to be. Those couple minutes for yourself will literally change your entire life. And it'll also help you realize that when your child wakes up, they're looking around for guidance. They're wondering, what should I be focused on today? Am I stressed out because mom is stressed out because she's cooking breakfast and is going to be late? You know what I mean? And so these are things you need to remember, not only um, for the child in front of you. But like I said earlier, that inner child, you need to take care of that inner child. So do take some time for yourself and do what you want. <clears throat> Jason, um, Tressa has a question to ask. Yeah. Hi, hi, Jason. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Awesome. This is fantastic. I'm so um, excited to be with you all today. So um, I have an interesting question about like the phrase, 
when we talk to our kids and say, I'm proud of you. I always hear like an attachment. Like I, I never want my kids to have like X has to happen in order for my parents to be proud of me, like yes. home run, straight A's, this and that. So I tend to not say I'm proud of you to my kids um, because I just think it like something has to happen in order. So I, I tend to say, Hey buddy, I see you working hard or mm -hmm. good work or, you know, when you did that, that was like really so nice of you, like different types of acknowledgements. And I've talked uh -huh. to other parents about this and they're like, that's crazy. You don't say like, I'm proud of you to your kids. So what's your coaching on that? Like, clearly I'm proud. Like, well, I don't want them to have to get hard. straight A's to get, you know what yeah, I mean? Well, chances are, if I had had enough time with you, we could probably draw this down to something that your parents or one of your caregivers told you. And as a child, you programmed that in. Um, for me, it was, it was be humble, you know, be super humble. Don't tell anybody any good things about yourself. And, and those were just little things that get implanted in you that you keep until you actually learn to reprogram them. But on the proud front, it doesn't have to be anything. And that's what I think we need to realize is you can be proud of your child just because of the way they embrace life. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. You're so amazing. I'm so proud of you. You did so good in school today. And you know what? When you got that F, you didn't freak out. Like, uh, that's yeah. so awesome. Not like, why did you get that? It's like, oh my gosh, most people would have been so stressed out. I love how you handled that. You're an amazing human. Wow. I, I'm, I'm learning from you. You're amazing. Thank you for teaching me how to, how to really respond in a, in a stressful situation. And I, and I think just a, a little bit more of that. I think I want my kids to be proud of themselves, not yes. do things to make me proud of them. So I guess I use like the verbiage, like I see you working hard or you should be mm -hmm. proud of yourself. Like, you know, you really put effort into studying for that math test. I know you hate math, blah, blah, blah. So are, is that good enough or, do, or is the well, I'm proud of you? I think that what, I try, what I try and get across is you don't always have to wait for an astounding accomplishment to yes. tell your child you're proud of them. You yes. can you can just wake them up in the morning and say, oh my gosh, you're so dang cute. I'm so proud of you. We're going to have such an amazing day today. Sneak it in there. Yeah. If, it's, if, it's, if it's tough for you, just say, oh my gosh, I'm so proud of you the way you handled that. It doesn't have to be anything. Your child needs to be loved and praised. Yeah. Studies have shown, psychological studies, a child cannot be loved too much. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Yeah, I, I definitely do lots of that. I just didn't know if the I'm proud of you was like, is that important? It's super important because having your parent proud of you builds your foundation for the rest of your life. Hmm. I, it, it's interesting. I don't want to take too much of the time, but it's funny. Like my mom will say to me, oh, you know, you did this, you did that, you did this. She did that. I was not, it doesn't matter to me if my parents are proud of me or not. Is that weird? That, that, no, not at all. That, that's, that just goes. I'm proud, I, feel, I feel proud of myself for all yeah. of these things. Yeah. And it's like, oh, I thank you. I appreciate the gift of the compliment, but it, I'm, it makes really no difference to me. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, I think it's good. It's a healthy um, way of confirming and validating yourself. And I think as any human, we should. But some of yeah. us who are always uh, reinforced by negative or positive validation. And so exactly. I think that's and I, I think that's incredible. Excellent. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, so guys. thank you so much, Jason. Um, we you. are always inspired by you. And um, we're going to have some time after Ricky. Um, um, we're going to have a break after Ricky's question Q&A. So if you guys have any questions other questions for Jason, you'll have a second chance at it. Um, so our next guest, all the way from California, um, he is Karen and uh, my, how do you say, our bestie. We're a trio. We're about to speak in California. We're flying out just to join him. Um, this is Ricky Lacorte. He's been speaking for over 20 years, so that makes him 10. Um, he's a speech coach. <laughs> 
<laughs> professional entertainer, uh, keynote speaker. Uh, he was a top 10 finalist in the Toastmasters World Championship of Public Speaking in 2018. His, um, he has a Breaking Your Barriers YouTube channel, which inspires his listeners and people like us to know that no matter what your story is, you can make an impact on the world, that you can overcome and take your pain to have mm. passion. And his parents, um, you know, they really, his mom is here, um, really inspired him to, to follow his dreams and be the best version of himself. Uh, you'll be inspired. He shares a lot about how he was a troubled teen and how he gave his mom white hair. No, I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> And, um, how you know he he grew up and he made decisions at a young age um to be a part of a gang and how he was influenced by his teacher um to to change his life and by by doing that um he's able to inspire people and so with further ado guys this is Ricky Lacorte <laughs> Daz well, first and foremost, I just want to say I love you to all of you, and I, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Every time I get on stage, it is my responsibility, it is my responsibility to leave you with something and to make certain that I take that responsibility and accountability very serious. Now, that being said, and being a speaker, I like to keep it succinct. So everything that Jason said, the end. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. You're, you're awesome, dude. And I even had to get the same haircut today. I'm telling you, I follow greatness. Now, that being said, people are thinking, what am I going to get in 10 minutes? Jason proved it. And more importantly, 10 minutes is a lifetime. If what you say is from your heart, if what you say is something that's either going to destroy somebody or uplift somebody. And I'm going to give you a short story about where I've come from, who I am, and so on and so forth. And at this time, I've got some news for you. I've got my placard little notes right here ready for you guys because I respect what I'm going to share with you and I respect your time. You are a parent, even if you don't have a kid. I want you to keep that in mind. You are a parent. Even if you don't have a kid, you're probably thinking, how is that possible? I'll get to that. Your words are more powerful than any drug, bomb, bullet, or circumstance. So use these weapons properly. Because these weapons can be used for good. They can be used for bad. It takes a village to raise a child. We've all heard the saying. It's absolutely true. And I wouldn't have any other village with me than this village I have in front of me. Because we're all aiming towards the same goal, which is to change our community for the better and to raise future leaders and future upstanding citizens. That being said, I'm also going to share that we have to make a decision whether we're gonna love somebody that is impossible to love. I'm talking about, and let me be completely candid with you. I'm talking about a jerk. I'm talking about a stupid person. I'm talking about a loser. I'm talking about a gang member. I'm talking about a hoodlum. And I've known so many of these losers in my life. Every morning that I woke up, I looked at that loser. And you're probably thinking, oh, Rick, you're not a loser. No, no, I was. My mom will tell you. That's why she has those white hairs. My mom will tell you. Yeah, I was a loser. I was terrible. I vandalized. I stole. I beat up people. I did all kinds of crazy things as a youth. Police knew me by first name. Teachers hated me. Unfortunately and oddly enough, women loved me. It was weird. I don't know what I guess that bad boy image thing, but <laughs> it's weird. Now, I digress. <laughs> I wanted to say that one of the greatest influences as well as one of the greatest heroes after sharing that kind of person that I was had to be my mom. Now you're probably thinking, oh, that's the most obvious. Sadly enough, it's not. She is 
to this day, one of the greatest heroes in my life. And it was not immediately established. It took time for me to realize this. It took time for me to realize how amazing she was because she worked two and a half jobs, 20 hours just to raise us because my dad was out to sea serving in the Navy. She is to this day, not only my greatest fan, not only my greatest hero, but during this time in my life, she was public enemy number one. Yeah, I'm talking about you, mom. I know you're there somewhere listening. You should open up your camera, let them see you. <laughs> she, she, not only had, she not only had to put up with me, she had to put up with me, with me and three other stupid siblings. Now, do I use that word quite openly and honestly? Yes, I do. Why? Well, if you're not stupid, how is it that me and my brothers go out in the middle of the night dressed like ninjas trying to vandalize our neighborhood and we're so stupid we forgot to put our mask on? That's just stupid at its greatest. So the point behind that is we we were bad. We were bad news. And I, I do thank my mom. Now, a lot, a lot has changed. A lot has changed when I... Well, the reason why it's, it's a little bit uh, tough for me is because I know what I put my mom through. So forgive me. <laughs> Woo. <sighs> Give me one second to compose myself. During, during my chaotic and adrenaline-filled, turbulent rise to infamy, And then my immediate downfall. This came in the form of so many times in my life, I had a chance of dying. So many times in my life, I had a chance of being incarcerated. But the biggest change came when I finally broke the camel's back with the last straw, which was breaking my mom's heart. This was where everything changed for me. And it didn't come in the form of my mom. It didn't come in the form of my gang member friends. It didn't come in the form of anybody. It came in the form of an unassuming hero in my life who changed everything. And I proudly say his name, Mr. Alan Mitz, my band teacher. Yes, Jason, you said it right. It can be anybody and anything it doesn't even have to be your parent. That's why at the very beginning of this, I mentioned you do not have to be a parent. Mr. Mitz was not a parent. He didn't have his own children, but he did have his own children. All of the band members that he changed the lives of. I was one of them. Now, the reason I bring this to light is because you and I, have so much more influence than we can imagine. And I'm gonna share it like all of the champions in here, similarly to what everybody is saying. 10 minutes in a day can change a child's life. It only took Mr. Mitz 10 minutes a day to change mine. Every teacher, every police, everybody thought I was a loser and they rightfully so thought that. I was, but 10 minutes of his time when everybody else said I'm worthless, Ricky, something's bothering you. And mind you, this teacher insulted him every day. What's up, fatty? What's up, Toba Lard? What's up? You know, I was calling him the, what is that dude that breaks through the wall? Um, That drink? I forgot that red drink. <laughs> Kool-Aid, Mr. Kool-Aid. So, so I thought I would insult him, yet this man that I insulted was the one who did what I mentioned earlier. How can you change somebody's life in 10 minutes? How can you be a parent when you're not a parent? And more importantly, how can you show love to somebody that is impossible to love? And that was me. That was me. He did all of this. And within that 10 minutes and within that span of time, he showed me the love. He showed me the care. And he said this, look at what's bothering you. Oh my God, you're actually talking to me? Why? I insult you. By the way, Ricky, I want to tell you something before we leave today. Yes, Mr. Mitz, you have so much potential. You should have seen my face. I was like, huh? I thought I wasn't doing, I thought I was doing doing drugs. 
for him to say that. I was like, really? He saw something in me in the future that I couldn't even see for myself. All I saw was the present and my present was being an idiot. His poignant words and his very loving words made me realize there's another way. And that's how I found music. At the same token, he introduced me to the sexiest instrument out there. That's right. And you're thinking, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, it was the cheapest instrument that we could afford at the time. So he brought me to where I am today by making me realize there is more. He made me realize that it takes a village to raise a child. He made me contemplate what I was doing when I was at the top, I was at the pinnacle of my popularity as an infamous gang member. The man that never took my insults to heart and he saw the best even though I showed him the worst. So that being said, we all have the power. We all have the responsibility. And we all, regardless if we have biological children, our parents, we all can make a difference if we will come together. It's not about the number of people that we have, for example, in this room. It's the number of people each person in this room touches and affects with their 10 minutes that they're given with any given child. So I want you to remember this. Every single one of us in here is now accountable to one another because we have a team who will develop our future, which is the children of today. And what's beautiful is this, I, can, I wanna pay it forward. Regardless if a kid is, what I said earlier, stupid, loser, jerk, worthless, whatever. I will never judge based on that. I will never use that against them. I will find a different way to create a perception such as, dude, I used to tag like that. But you know what I did? I said, I don't want to get caught by the police, man. You got, you got that artistic talent. How about putting that on paper, bro? So if you talk to them rather than talk down to them, they may realize, wait a minute, somebody actually likes my art and it will change them. How do I know that? I never thought I would love music. So I want to leave you with this. I want to leave you with this, my amazing champions. Continue to influence, continue to learn, continue to do this one thing that I teach my students, which is be willing to make mistakes. Because most people tell us, oh, you shouldn't make mistakes. Be willing to make mistakes because you are taking action. You're paving your own path and you're taking risk or towards something that might actually be an even bigger benefit towards people listening. So parents, keep doing what you do. Keep inspiring. And thank you, Karen, for having this amazing summit. I love you all and I appreciate you all. Thank you. Oh my gosh, Ricky, thank you, thank you, thank you. I think every parent and even non-parent needs to know that because there's there's so much what guilt or pressure to say the right thing, to do the right thing. And thank you so much for sharing your story. Any questions, any comments? Oh, let me just say something. Yeah, that was a great example. Thank you. Um, and that's just was my point. You know, it can be anybody. And we forget that children, you know, you you yell at a child at school because they're misbehaving, not understanding. Maybe they don't even have any parents at home. You know, maybe that's the one minute you had to change their life um, and maybe understand them. You know, so thank you for for sharing that. That's so, so important. Appreciate you, brother. Love you, Jason. And love you guys in here. And if I got a little bit emotional there, it's because I know where I've been. I know where I've come from. And to be here on the stage with all of you champions, it just makes me realize that we all, we all can do anything. And if we believe and we realize that we can do anything, guess what? We in turn impart that same power onto the next generation or the people we're listening to. 
So I really, I really love being here. Appreciate being on the same wonderful stage with all of you. And if there are any questions, I do, I do have a few moments before I jump onto this next. Yeah, time. if anybody has one or two questions, Ricky has to run. He has a a, a big meeting with Toastmasters. <laughs> <laughs> Or if you guys want to have a feedback, Jeanette, you have anything to say? Because so this is my best friend, Jeanette. Um, she does work with. Um, uh, 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 can you explain, Jeanette? Yes, <laughs> I I actually work with um what they're labeled as is at risk kids. Most of them come from a suicidal background. Um, uh, they are my special students. I work with seventh grade to twelfth graders, and a great reminder to always value my time and words with them um and that uh a teacher is always important in a child's life and uh how we treat them Jason was saying you know we can't yell at them because we're so irritated but to really silence myself to think about what I really want to say and how I want to influence them because the short amount of time with all the students that I have I know it's important on how it'll affect their view of themselves and, you know, um, I just value my time with the kids. I mean, I, I love being a teacher with them. It's such a great privilege. It has a lot of hard times, Karen would know, <laughs> but, you know, it's super rewarding. But I, I'm so grateful for what you just shared. It was very, very valuable. Thanks, Ricky. Very, very welcome. And just to give you guys, here, here are some of the Is this oh, oh, I can't hear you. Oh. I can't really hear you. I'm sorry, I was covering the thing, wasn't I? <laughs> okay. They've done some heinous, heinous crimes or whatnot. And I don't judge it based on that. I judge it based on the fact that they were willing to meet with me and they were willing to see another side of the coin, not just their current circumstance, regardless of their income level, their community. They said, Ricky, what can I do? And I told them, you keep in touch with me. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to forget you. I'm going to remember you. And I'm going to see if we can push you towards that greatness and unleash what you do have in you. What are you excited about? What do you like to do? What is your passion? What, what is it that excited you as a kid? Every kid wanted to be a firefighter. Every kid wanted to be uh, some kind of police or something, you know, whatever it may be, whatever their father or mother was. And so I, I'm very honored to work with troubled youth. And Jeanette, just want to say, you're a champion. Keep doing what you do. Every single one of you guys in here are champions. Every single one of you guys in here are amazing. Keep doing what you do. And Jason, thanks for starting us off with that amazing, amazing, amazing speech. Love you, brother. And Brad, as well as Anybody else is speaking today? I can't wait. I can't wait to hear you guys when we get on the same stage together. But I have to say one thing. Sandy, I love you. It's been a minute <laughs> since I've seen you. I haven't forgotten about you. Don't forget to get her book, The Power to Rise. She is awesome. And I, I apologize for there's no kids in here. But Sandy is badass. She's awesome. Tie, tie up with her. Connect with her. Awesome. Oh, uh, uh, Chelsea, yes. You, you had a question, my dear. <laughs> Um, I didn't have a question. I just wanted to say thank you for sharing your story and your speech, Ricky. Um, everybody who went previously as well. Um, it really impacted me, especially in a season where I'm transitioning into like my passion and my work. Um, working on social media and taking my passion and my heart was a transition for me during the pandemic because everything I do is in person. And then when you're on social media, it's just a whole different experience. Cause like Jason was saying. Um, which I thank Jason for mentioning that was like, don't worry about other people. Don't try to follow what other people are doing. And I'm pretty grounded. I'm being confident in myself. Um, but it's a study that I'm documenting myself and maybe anybody else, if y'all want to do that, there are real impacts of social media and how it literally like impacts our brain, impacts our way of thinking. So anyway, all of that to say, um, I work with a lot of troubled teens too. So yes, Jeanette, um, you're super awesome. I really appreciate you. I appreciate everybody here. Um, but it just impacted me and reminded me 
um, about what I want to do, which is I always want to work with the people where society or parents or the school is saying like, they're done. There's nothing we can do about that. Cause that was me as well. And I fell through the cracks on, 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 uh, in middle school and high school, all the way up into my adulthood as well. Um, so if you, for you to share your story about your mom and, you know, her being your hero and then those teachers as well, it, it reminded me that along my way, regardless if I was physically alone, mentally, emotionally alone, there was these little angels in every corner that was kind of like there. And um, it just reminds us to just appreciate everything. So yeah, thank you. It's very exciting and grateful. You guys are really encouraging me, especially in a, a season where I've been in sort of like a dry season, quote unquote. And that's been because I've been like releasing a lot, not only personally, but also professionally. So that way I can make space for all the newness to come in. So love. Love right back to you. And before I head out, let me show you, let me show you what a dumbass looks like. And I, I can't, I can't, I can't not filter that. I got to see it the way it is because like what Jason said, you got to be yourself. And I am myself. Even though I used to be a former gang member, I'm no longer one. It's still, it's still, I got to be myself. And let me show you a former dumbass. Ricky, which one is you? <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, it's Ricky yeah. with hair. <laughs> with hair. <laughs> with long yeah. hair. But let, let me just say for all of us, whenever we're in an environment where someone like Ricky's awesome mom isn't present to speak up for the child, be the voice for even that kid that can acknowledge later on that maybe they weren't making the smartest decisions because when Ricky was talking about his band teacher I was actually thinking I bumped into someone from 28 years ago and the thing that they remembered was me absolutely losing my nut on the high school campus where I was a teacher and like everyone from like four classrooms around stopping and gluing to the window because I went head to head with a teacher who told a troubled kid, a troubled young boy that he was a piece of shit. And I lost my nut. And the kid came to my class as a place of refuge in the back of the class and then just burst into tears in the break because no one had ever stood up for him. And I bumped into him and his mom about six years later. And the thing he said to me was, Hey, you know, I'm not a piece of shit. So you never know when you stop someone trying to abuse a position of authority or a power, the difference that you make in reminding someone that they really do have value and have that potential, that infinite potential like Ricky, like the world would be so less without Ricky on the planet now infinite potential even when you're not doing your best as a as a young teen <laughs> thank well, you all. thank you so much sandy and then that's when we realized it's just like ricky said it could even be less than 10 minutes where we can truly make a difference you know i've heard stories where someone was about to end their life and then they see a stranger smile at them or just something so tiny happens and it it gives them just the slightest hope you know to move on Ricky, I took one sentence, right? Yeah. I wish he was here. <laughs> Great to hear his stories. Oh, wait, wait, Ricky, you're, you got to unmute. Muted. There you go. Yeah, I wish. He's, he's, he's ill. Oh. I've been trying to reach out to him just to say thank you because I wanted to apologize for giving him hell when I was in junior high. I'm not, I'm not sad for where I've come from, but I am sad for the things I did during those times in my life because had I not gone through that stuff I wouldn't be who I am today and I I wouldn't have as much love for people as I do if I didn't have as much hatred as I did back then so I'm, I'm thankful for the journey I've been on and for those of you that are still here you've got a few powerhouses that are going to be coming up you've got Brad coming up you've got Sandy 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 my goodness amazing both of you guys all of you guys every single one of you to put this together Des my sister more power to you guys. I'll see you guys on the at the next event. Thank, Thank you, Ricky.
I agree, Sandy. I bet the his band teacher would love to see, and who knows, maybe he has seen Ricky. So we are going to have a, a short break before Sandy comes on. I, I wanted to just uh, share three guided affirmations that I found. Um, there's so many, but I thought today, um, since, you know, Jason and like everyone who's been sharing, I mean, people asking questions and what should we say to our child, I think these three affirmations have helped me. I think regardless you're, you're a parent or not, just something to help us remind ourselves of our worth, remind ourselves like what is truly important. So the first one is, I understand my child's personality. If you're not a parent, I understand my personality and actively listen to myself because I think that self-critic often, in, you know, takes over, right? The negative narrative that Jason shares is like from, from birth, from like when you're in utero and we don't even know that negative story that we just automatically believe without questioning. So if we just say, you know, I understand my child's personality or I understand myself and actively listen to me or them. The second one I've been trying to practice consistently and Des reminds me is I take time for self care and choose to practice patience when I'm frustrated. This is the one that I'm currently working on because I think if we're tired, we're hungry, we're just, you know, when you have zero patience and just pause, be aware. I think that's the one thing, right, Jason, is like be aware because if we're running on automatic pilot, that default kicks in and we automatically react right before we respond so self-care practice patience when we're frustrated lastly i find this powerful i am a powerful example of optimism strength and courage not just to our child but to ourselves and i think just just listening to everyone here has just truly lifted my spirits i had a lot of anxiety and i don't know why deslin and sandy and everyone was just reminding me that it, it's beyond my expectations. I'm so grateful for everyone who's um, attending and my speakers. Thank you so much. And I can't wait for Deslin to introduce our powerful Australian guest speaker today. Go for it. Oh, wait, you're. Hi, yeah. guys. Okay, sorry. Technical difficulties. Uh, just a second. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to go off of notes, but I'm just going to do my own personal rendition of this. Um, I'm truly honored and privileged um, to introduce to you uh, my soul sister, uh, my best friend. Um, because of the pandemic, we became friends on Instagram. Uh, Sandy Davis is a woman that has been through so much in life. It is because of her experience with bullying at a young age. It is because of her experience with the loss of her brother to suicide. Um, it is through having an incredible hero, her mother, um, in her life that she's become so much greater than she could ever imagine in this lifetime. Um, Sandy Davis is the founder. She came out of retirement. <laughs> and um, started a, a business um, called Happy Paws. Uh, for those who are in menopause, perimenopause like me, um, um, to be able to have a natural product to help you find relief. Something that um, her mother endured. Um, and so this is her way of um, remembering her mother and being able to give a gift of happiness to someone in, in such a small jar. And um, she also had a vision to, to do a book about bullying. And so she compiled a book called um, The Power to Rise Above. Um, and it compiles of 30 authors globally, worldwide. There it is. <laughs> and uh, Chelsea's on here. Karen yes. and I um, are, are one of the authors, are, are four, uh, four of the authors, or three of the authors. Uh, and Sandy's also the author, but um, it's just an honor and a privilege of, you know, when we share about bullying, we often think about a person, but in actuality, um, it's ourselves because we, we transfer what people say about us and we make that our truth. And so um, the book that 
she published in Australia. And this is my first time and Chelsea's first time becoming book authors alongside Karen and Sandy. Sandy, in one year, Sandy was published three times. She's been in three books. This book, The Power to Rise Above, what the foreword was by um, Oprah Winfrey's favorite, favorite um, guest, um, Dr. Tarani, how do you say it? Yeah, yeah Dr. Tarani Trent, you've got it. <laughs> and so um, I'm just really um, grateful because sometimes we don't realize that when we show love, when we overcome our fears and we show up scared that we have the power to change someone's life forever. And this is the woman that has done that for me. And so with further ado, guys, this is Sandy Davis. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It is such a joy to be here, and I'm having to go scrambling now for another book because we actually have in our audience Brenda Kakai, and she wrote with me in Sacred Promise, and her story of surviving Civil War in Bougainville and absolutely doing everything within her power to ensure that her children were safe and loved and knew every day that they were worthy and they were enough. She made so many sacrifices to provide for her kids and provide her kids stability and love. And I think maybe we actually might have to have Brenda on the Parenting Summit next year because her story is so inspiring and moving and just she is one of those amazing moms of showing up just like Ricky's mom. And it was such a joy to have Mrs. LaCorte in our audience. And I just feel like it doesn't matter what Jason has to say, what Ricky has to say, what I have to say, what Brad has to say. Ricky's mom simply being present is the only message we need. And if we have had the misfortune of not having those parents that provided us unconditional love, it doesn't matter because we do the journey then to love ourselves unconditionally and then take that forward to the next generation of giving our kids and the people that we care for that absolute unconditional love. And that was one of the themes that ran through all of our 30 authors in The Power to Rise Above was that need and desire for unconditional love. So whether or not we receive that as a child, that is is our responsibility to provide that unconditional love going forward. Um, before I get into all of that, I am here today on Guga Yalangi country. So I am a Kansas born girl, just like Jason was a Kansas born boy. And we both took paths that took us on a wild ride of adventure. My wild ride of adventure landed me in the World Heritage listed Daintree Rainforest on this Guggiology country whose elders, past, present, and emerging, I acknowledge with deep, deep, deep abiding respect. It is a gift every day to be on the edge of the rainforest at the meeting of the Coral Sea, especially as a girl from wheat country. Um, I moved up to this spot after our kids were grown. And for us, it was such a freeing, liberating moment, our kids going into adulthood. And I often forget now about the journeys that we went through in parenting. And like Karen, you were earlier saying about, you know, apologizing to your kids. You know, I am so big on nah. Like we can we can do a little apology, but no big apologies. Hey. We're doing the best we can. And if you're actually here in this space now, you are an awesome parent. If you are listening to this, you are already an awesome parent or an awesome caregiver, awesome educator, awesome person in the circle of children because you're here. Even just already being willing to learn and to grow, <laughs> done deal. Just show up. Um but the main thing I wanted to talk about today, I guess, was my parenting truths. I wanted to talk about just basically love. Like love is all there is. Love, 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 love. Love your kids so hard, no matter what. And even like Ricky said, no matter if they're being a jerk, if they're being dumb, if they're being stupid. As teenagers, we can all remember when we were really stupid or we did really dumb things. So, <laughs> no, no, no. See, I'm I'm a bit biased. Jason's going to try to tell you that he did dumb things as a kid. Nah. 
Now, this kid had a spark from day one. Anything that he might define as stupid was just one of those building blocks to awesomeness. <laughs> but yeah, and we've got to, in addition to just love, 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 we've got to let our kids fail. We've got to let them fall. And we've got to not take blame for that. And a bit cheeky here, but sometimes as a parent, you have to be a bitch. And then you also just have to trust your kids and trust their journey. So with regards to love being all there is, I love what Jason said about those 10 minutes. Those 10 minutes are so crucial in the morning and at night. And our daughter, youngest daughter is now 40. And we have just had a big family visit into the outback to visit her. And I love that some of those patterns of that 10 minutes, we're still doing when we're all grown adults and just goofing around. And I loved that we did, there was a TV show in the seventies called the Waltons. And at the end of the night with the Waltons, all of the family would say, good night, John boy, good night, Mary Ellen. And it would just go on and on and on. When we as adults go and stay in our adult daughter's house, we have that whole Waltons thing and we make up all the names and squeal back and forth and everybody's giggling and on one of those nights, my husband got up out of bed and went in to give her another good night cuddle. And I think, you know, we never are too old to not need and want that unconditional love. So as long as you are in the life of your child, whether you had that amazing unconditional love or not, give them that unconditional love at every age. It's absolutely timeless, that kind of unconditional love. And I wanted to go back then, not just to adulthood, but I'm going to go back to my childhood for a moment with that letting them fall. I think you have to let your kids fall. You have to let them fail. And you, just, you have to manage that. Like you can't let them have a complete catastrophic fail and a fall at three years old. Like you have to know when to catch your kids, but you have to also know when you can just sort of cushion them and when you can let go and let them take that lesson away. So I want to just read a little bit from one of the other books I did this year, Courage and Confidence, What It Really Takes to Succeed in Business. I loved writing in this book because I shared a lot of what I learned from my mom. And I discovered when my mom passed that I had learned so much even about business that I didn't really realize was direct from her until she was gone. But back when I was six, at six, it was the time that I skated a bit too far away from home. I stacked it in a most spectacular crash that would leave this digitally connected era in utter awe if body cameras had been a thing in the 1970s. I would have gone viral for sure. I sat there bloodied and bruised on the ground, wailing for my mother. And then it hit me. Being comp confident enough to roller skate too far meant whether I wanted the comfort of my mother or not, I'd skated myself into a position where I was the only one who could take care of me. Still whimpering, I picked myself up. I gathered what little pride I had left and determinedly stood up to skate back home for Band-Aids. As I turned around, I saw my mother running up the street, arms open wide, ready to brush my tears away and make everything all better. Of course, I leapt, skates and all, into those welcoming arms of comfort. But the lesson had already been learned in the moment of rising up on my own. We all fall down. We all have moments of rejection. We all cry. But we determine our success in the moment of getting up. And I just feel like, you know, one of the most important things that we can do as a parent is have those arms open wide and let our kids leap in, skates and all. But also just be able to stand back enough to let them get up first so they know that they own it and they will always get up because once our kids are adults, well, even as teenagers, we aren't always there. So when they have that confidence and that knowledge that they can get up and they will do it, we can be the empathetic sounding board and the pillow after they've gotten up. And I know it was a bit cheeky, but I said about being a bitch. One of the worst moments with our eldest teenager 
was when she was trying to tell me what for. And I, you know, as mums and dads, we always don't, we don't always say the right things. And I said, wait, I know you think I'm being a bitch. And before I could finish the rest of my conversation, she said, what? How did you know? How do you have bitch to your face? <laughs> But she had been talking up to her friends that I was being a bitch because I was the person that was helping her set her goals to reach the um, the goal that she had set for herself. And it was taking a little bit of hard work and a little bit of determination to get there. And she was ready to give up. And I got the blame for being a bitch and the big meanie for helping her get through those goals. And she still looks back now. And is so glad that she had someone that could help her and not push her to my own agenda or push her to something that we want as parents for our kids, but to help our kids just give them those extra tools and the equipment that they need to get over that finish line. So I always say now, you know, if you haven't had the experience of your child rolling their eyes so far, they're going to fall over or calling you a name or just absolutely screaming and wailing about how awful and unfair you are, you might not be doing it right. It's going to happen. And you have to remember that they're kids. And that is just one of those adulting roles sometimes that you have to do. And sometimes it sucks being an adult. And sometimes as an adult, you have to be the bad guy. But it's totally okay. And we don't always need approval back from our kids. Sometimes the role of a parent is to simply be there and give them love, even when they don't want love and give them boundaries that help them make their own decisions, even when they don't want those boundaries. But then we also have to know when to let go of those boundaries, know that we have done everything we can for them and trust them to leap and make those decisions for themselves and accept that we have raised our children to be capable people who can make their own decisions that aren't the same decisions we would make. And we learned that lesson when our youngest was a teenager and we thought she was ready to be responsible, to make decisions. We gave her all the reasons why she shouldn't go to the all night movies and let her list the reasons why she should. And then in that moment of trust, all right, it's your decision now. She jumped up, did a wiggle, kissed me on the cheek, kissed her dad on the cheek and said, thanks, I'm off. And we're like, wait, what? This wasn't the decision our responsible child was supposed to make. <laughs> but we had said we trusted her and we had to let her go. So quite often we think that we want them to make the decisions that we want them to make, but we have to trust them once they have all that equipment to make their decisions and we have to trust in it. And it turned out it was the best suited decision ever for her personality and for her future. But for us, like as parents, we went, oh, you made them wrong. Doesn't matter. They'll make wrong decisions. We have to let them. Um, and I know I've got to go because we're just into time. But I also wanted, on that note of letting them make decisions, I wanted to talk about Karen's book. I just love this book about mama's got to let go and how to let go without losing your sanity because Karen talks about stop being a helicopter and I know when I was a teacher uh -huh. <laughs> and Des you're doing such a good job of letting go with a son as a teenager now you are not being a hovering helicopter I promise hand on heart I know as a teacher one of the biggest things for me with parents when I was teaching senior kids getting ready to go to college or do TAFE um, or do like industrial training or leap out into the workplace, parents really need to back off. And that was one of the hardest things for me as a teacher, when you would try to explain to, to parents that they need to back off. Parents don't want to hear that. But once your kids are teenagers, you've got to back off a little bit and let them start making choices. I love that Karen says, stop being a helicopter. I've learned that as a mom, my job is not to prevent my girls from feeling sad, but to be there for them to lean on. And grades do not matter. And I love, Jason was talking about that as well. We've got to love our kids for who they are and for their existence on this planet and remind them that at every step of the way, they are enough, regardless of grades, regardless of achievement, regardless of 
of any accolades they hoped for and didn't get, they are enough every single time. So thank you, Karen, for having this day and helping us redefine success for kids. Oh, thank um, you so much. Um, yeah, Jess, there's a question that someone asked. Yeah, I, I, um, Lydia had a question. What is the best response when your child talks back, things about you in front of you and behind your back? Like, what, what do you, what do you recommend or the best response? Cause it, like you said, it does happen, but like, cause now mm -hmm. your kids are older and you have two daughters. Uh, what do you recommend? You know, if your kids are talking smack to your face at, or behind your back, either way, the first step is to breathe. Like you have got to give yourself space and grace. Breathe. Don't address it in the heat of the moment. You've got to let it, you've got to find a way to sort of extract yourself from it without letting those, those Medusa snakes spring from your head. Um, and kids like to push our buttons. Quite often they can have something going on deep inside and that's why they're pushing our buttons because if they lash out at us, what's going on inside can be diminished in their, in their head. So breathe give it space, do that 10 minutes in the morning, like Jason is talking about, of making sure that you have a peaceful morning where they wake up knowing that they are loved and they are accepted and that you are absolutely 110% there for them. And then when they're in a calm space and in the right frame of mind, you can have a talk about it and talk, ask about even why they lashed out as well as the fact that it hurt. And usually once things are calm applying to that reason as long as it is dashed out with oodles of unconditional love will get you across the finish line and jason might have a few more in input um tips on that one as well well you uh if you want some neuroscience behind it absolutely can you guys hear me yes yes okay. um the best thing you said breathe Take a minute, breathe. One thing I work with uh, a lot of PTSD and, and high anxiety patients. One thing you have to understand is you cannot rationalize with someone who has been extremely triggered when they're in that yes. moment. Um, and it's, it's even harder with a child because an adult, um, they will disconnect that frontal lobe will disconnect. And the lower brain stem will take over and you'll respond from that, that habitual um, place, fight, flight or freeze, right? Um, and allowing yourself to breathe for a minute will allow you to actually regulate. And it's harder with a child and I'm laughing inside and I probably shouldn't be because their frontal lobe isn't even connected anyway. So, <laughs> oh my gosh, that's got to be the hardest thing in the world. And, and that's, Seriously, that's the best thing you said is just breathe because you have to just relax or you're going to be triggered. You're going to just pour gas on the fire. So, yes, breathe, uh -huh. relax, respond in a calm manner and talk about it later when you're both regulated. Exactly. And and don't take it personally. That's yeah. the other thing. Like it's one of the things my husband always says is don't forget that your child is a child. They're not a responsible adult. They're not your friend. So often, like when they're when they're lashing out, they need you as a calm, responsible adult to think about how this has become how this has come from them as a child. And the biggest thing is, you know, often that just that big bear hug of of love. Great, great response. Yeah, I think I have students who also say, "Can you go away? When are you going to leave?" Why, why are you here? You're going to come back? <laughs> what? And then like Jason said, it, it took, it, it's hard not to take it personally, but I've learned to do what both of you said. You just deep breathe. And I just look at them and I'm silent. And nine times out of 10, they'll be like, oh, sorry. And it's like, you know, it's okay. Because you know that it's like, it's like I'm a dentist going in, pulling their teeth with them, you know, against their will. Right. But thank you so much. I just love how how things are flowing. Um, Lily said, thank you. This is helpful. I think it is really hard not to take it personally and feel, I used to feel like I had to say something. I had to answer them. I had to respond. And I love how both of you said, we don't need to respond. 
we just need to be. Yes, Chelsea said. A hundred percent. Well, let us introduce our last powerful speaker. Who, yes, from Idaho. You guys are just covered in snow, and I'm sure though you have an amazing <laughs> presentation for us. He is the author of the number one bestseller, DNA of a Winner, podcaster of Best BEST Self and Life Coach. He's going to help us learn how to practice strategies to guide our children not only in building a winning mindset, but I think Brad believes that parents, he's going to share a little bit about how he's a dad of a special needs child and how that affected, how does that affect, you know, a, a parent and how do we learn, like Sandy was saying, to meet our kids where they are, accept our kid where they're at and not, you know, how do we deal with the, the pressure of expectations? Because it is hard not to want the milestones or the achievements. Thank you, Brad. You bet. Oh my goodness. I request to go first next time. I feel like I'm <laughs> mentally exhausted just listening to this hamster wheel of awesome for the last hour. So tough. Oh my goodness. Uh, so yeah. And uh, if you've seen the top of my head for about 90 minutes, because I'm burning a hole in my paper, listening to all these rock stars, I wish I had uh, Ricky's hair when he was 18. Still, I'm starting to look more like Jason though. So, uh, hey, uh, hey, thanks for thanks for doing this. And thanks for all the parents that are on here right now. Uh, man, I, you know, people always ask me these type of questions when I get on these platforms. And I, and it's usually not the answers they expect. They usually ask me or I think I'm going to say something about their kiddos or steps or some sexy step for their kiddos. But uh, the truth is we always have to start with us. We always have to invest in us. The best investment we can ever make is the one in us. And, you know, sometimes the most selfish thing you can do is to get a little selfish. Uh, because if you know anything about the leadership lid, you know that, you know, we're all leaders in our households, we're leaders in our communities, uh, where we work. Generally speaking, if we're in a leadership position, people, generally speaking, aren't going to rise above us. They're going to try to rise to us. And so they can't become the best version of themselves if we're not becoming the best version of ourselves. So by not investing in us, we're hurting all the people we care about the most. Uh, we're, we're hurting them. And we don't realize that all the time. But uh, man, 10 minutes is going to be tough for me, Karen, but I'll do my best. Uh, yeah, a little bit about me. Um, old Tress over there, she's a rock star, by the way, in the audience. Beast mode. She wakes up pissing excellence, I'm pretty sure, every morning. Uh, I've gone five minutes. I don't think I've given you any kind of value here. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so my my youngest, as Karen kind of alluded to, my youngest is on the autism spectrum. And if you haven't kind of gotten my vibe, uh, I'm a, I feel like I'm a pretty positive guy. I feel like I've been uh, an ambassador for kindness my entire life. Very outgoing. I always joke around. If I was at a wedding, you'd see me right in the middle of the dance floor, just cutting some serious rug. And I was a college athlete. My wife is kind of all those same things. And uh, I was also a career educator when my kiddo was diagnosed. So I'd worked with a lot of kiddos all over whatever spectrum, uh, autism spectrum, typical spectrum, you know, you name it. And when my kiddo got diagnosed, uh, it was really hard. I, I still... I still, I was listening to the other stories and I almost started getting choked up just listening to their stories. And I've told this story a thousand times and I still almost get choked up every time um, because you have, you have all these dreams and aspirations for your kiddos and all these things that you hope for them and you want to give them the best life possible. And when my kiddo was diagnosed at the age of three, man, it was the slowest walk ever to the car and wow, I don't know why I'm starting to get emotional here, but I, I, uh, it was just so hard. Like I'm, I'm shaking right now, just even talking about it. I just, I started thinking, I don't see all these things that could become, uh, bullying, struggling with friends, getting weird looks in the lunch line, getting kicked to the back of the you know, class. Cause you're not behaving weird looks on an air flight, you know, an airplane flight, uh, 
All of which came true, by the way. He's 16 now and has never had a sleepover in his life. No one eats with him at lunch. Uh, a lot of a lot of tough stuff. But I, I, for about 15 minutes, I always call it the the 15 minute sucker punch to the gut. I felt really sorry for him. Felt sorry for myself. Uh, all of the above. But by the time I got into my driveway at home. I sat in there for about five minutes and I just said to myself, what, what have I got to do? I said to myself, this is ridiculous. Feeling sorry for myself, feeling sorry for him. Those things aren't going to give him the best life possible. So what have I got to do moving forward for the next you know, 15 years before he graduates from high school? What have I got to do to give him the best life possible? And anything I was going into that moment, just got a highlighter put over the top of it. I was going to be forward-minded. I was going to be positive. I was going to be solution-oriented. I was going to be a phenomenal listener. I was going to be all these things. I was going to, and the thing about it is, these aren't things I'm going to do. These are things I'm going to become. And so as parents, and so that's like, that's like the cliff note version. There's been other stuff. My, my, my oldest was bullied in junior high, big time. Uh, my brother got run off a bridge by a drunk driver. My sister was part of a, a gang and uh, a meth dealer. I mean, there's it hasn't all been rosy on this end. But as our awesome speakers uh, before me, these aren't these are just building blocks to awesome. The the hamster wheel of awesome I talked about. Man, I'm on it. I'm on it. And anything that doesn't have me trending the direction I want to on that wheel, I'm gonna kick it to the curb. And so uh, while I was listening to these all these other rock stars, I was just writing down a bunch of notes and hopefully able to give you a little something, something extra that uh, that I've learned in my journey. Karen, how am I doing on time? OK, all right. So one of the things that I, I, I could tell you that has worked for me you know, with a kiddo on the autism, I'm just going to relate everything to my kiddo on the spectrum just to kind of offer up a different angle here. Uh, I have learned that I really got to be slow to speak and uh, slow to speak and quick to listen. Kiddos on the autism spectrum. And what you learn, by the way, is that we all have our own typical. You know, our societies are so anti-non-typical. We all have our own non-typical. We all have our own blueprint. We all have our own fingerprint. We all have our own hamster wheel of awesome. We all have our own thing. You learn this. But it's, with a kiddo on the spectrum, they get stimulated so quick and overstimulated their sensory is like whatever we got times 10 at times and it's a big spectrum so i'm generalizing here but uh i can't just i can't just blow my lid i can't just get fired up when they get fired up they feed off our energy so if i'm super positive if i'm super chill they're more apt to be more positive and super chill if I'm super angry, he feels that. If I'm super worked up, he feels that. And he starts to blow his lid. And you see that with a lot. I mean, whether we're talking about parenting or businessing or coaching or friendship or whatever, people feed off our energy. And so I've learned that, uh, yeah, I have to be slow to speak, quick to listen. I've learned that the success road that is not the end. Success isn't the end of the road. Success is the road. I've learned that I'm going to be more growth conscious and less goal conscious. I'm not saying goals aren't cool. We all have goals. But when you're focused on growth, uh, growths tend to mature us. Goals will motivate us, but growth will uh, mature us. Growth is more evergreen, whereas goals are more seasonal. Um, you know, I found that growth also when you're focused on the destination that you're not going to visit i know karen likes this word pity city you know you're not going to visit pity city and stay there doesn't mean that you're not going to visit pity city we're all going to visit pity pity city we're all going to have play the victim minus card at some point but you're not going to the the stay isn't going to be quite as long when you're growth minded when all you're all you're doing is tied to results and achievement and destination and and things, it's so much easier to get knocked down and tough to get back up. 
And so, man, the, the parenting, we, off our oldest, we thought we had the playbook down. We're dominating this thing. I mean, he's slaying life. He just, but man, you, you get a kid on the spectrum and man, straight sh shredder machine, chuck that playbook out the window. Cause you don't even know what two weeks from now is going to look like. You, you don't even, people ask, what's he going to do beyond high school? I have no idea. Yeah, I, what I know is we're going to slay today. We're not going to let yesterday overextend itself. We're not going to overvalue tomorrow. We're going to win this day, though. We're going to crush this day. Tress said earlier, uh, I see you working. Amen to that. Uh, we're just going to see, we're just going to praise the habits we wish to see out of him. That's what we're going to do. So we're going to really get caught up in habit. I think multiple peeps today have talked about habits and you know, 95% of our thoughts today will, will be subconscious, which essentially is habits, right? And so what kind of habits do we want to breed into our people we care about the most? What are we going to breed? What are we going to breathe? into them what are we going to infuse into them today what do we so that's what we're doing we're pinpointing and identifying habits that are going to lead us to where we want to go where is it do we want them to go what kind of core out values what kind of identity do we want to have in the people we care about the most and so if, if it doesn't fit one of those things that's that's clutter that's too many socks in the top drawer. I'm going to kick those bad boys out of our scheme. They have no place here. Um, probably just got a couple minutes here, a couple notes. Um, I will tell you, when you have a kiddo on the spectrum, and I'm, guys, I'm, I'm talking like, I'm talking about my kiddo on the spectrum, but, you know, one of my, my generally, one of my themes to when I speak is I've, everything I've learned about leadership, I learned through the lens of a child on the spectrum. I mean, all these things are cross-curricular. I'll end with this because I know I'm probably overextending my stay here. Brad, Brad, you have five more minutes. Five, huge. Yeah. All right. I was trying to make this thing all about me. And uh, okay, I can keep that thing going. Uh, it takes no special ability to be kind. It takes no special ability to be kind. Like I said, I feel like I've always been an amb ambassador to kindness. But man, when you live with a kid on the spectrum and you do see the way people look at them when they start to have a behavior, man, you no one no one hates it more than that parent when their kid is screaming on the airplane. We didn't roll out of bed today hoping to have behavioral issues. What you learn is that it takes no special ability to be kind. We can do that. And it doesn't have, you don't have to know the person to be kind to them. You don't have to know the person to wave to them and say, thank you for letting you go first at a four-way stop. You don't have to know the person's name to hold the door open. Someone's books fall on the floor and their stuff scatters everywhere and you help them pick that stuff up. They're not going to forget that. Oh, I mean, I feel like I just got a shot of Red Bull in my veins just talking about this stuff. That is the good stuff. And the more you do it, the more you become it. I mean, how sexy is that? The more you do this, the more you become this. And people notice this. And you're not doing it to be seen. Man, it just feels good. It feels good. People aren't searching for Ferraris in life. People are searching for feelings. People are searching for a lifestyle. For people want to be. And so I I you know, I always say you you could be at a you could be at a restaurant today. You could be uh you know, ordering, you know, you're out somewhere to eat and you're paying or, or let's just say you're at your table and you're treating that waitress or that waiter like an absolute rock star. Well, there's a, there's a 12 year old and the table next to you and the 12 year old sees how good you're treating this person. I mean, you can't, it's like looking at Sandy. I mean, you can't help but smile when you look at Sandy. I mean, I, I, I feel like I, it started six months of workouts just watching Sandy there for 10 minutes. It you see that you see how that waitress is feeling. And generally, the people you're eating with are feeling it too. You've got a room full of freaking awesome going on. And that took no special ability. And I'll, I'll say this: um, you know, the whole mantra of best self. I mean, that's kind of my that's kind of my thing. My podcast is best self podcast. 
I'm labeled the best self catalyst speaker. Um, I just, I, I think people that know me, that's kind of my thing. The cool thing about being our best self is that it travels. It, it takes no special ability to be your best self. It travels. The best self doesn't discriminate. The best self doesn't care if you're a male or female or whatever. Your best self doesn't care about your skin color. Your best self doesn't care what age you are. And the cool thing about being your best self is it can start today. I mean, it can, you know, whether you're six years old or 60 years old, it can start today. And so, uh, yeah, questions. Sorry, I can go forever, Jason. No, don't be sorry. You are fired, dude. I mean, we're so honored to have Sandy, Jason, and Ricky and you. Um, does anybody have a question or a comment? Well, someone had a question regarding how do we find humor when we are faced with tough challenges? You know, when you just think, I can't do this or this is too frustrating. I know death always um, helps me with humor when I'm about to cry or when I'm in the midst of crying. <laughs> wow. So how do we find that? Brad? Well, I think, I get, I think that's also a, a mindset thing. I think that a lot of people get upset because they're tying their emotions to a result or a thing. And if you're on the success road, if you're on the growth train, if you're on the positive train, you're not getting caught up in those things. And I'm saying this, I'm generally speaking, obviously there are certain events that happen in our life that are that really are significant and they are tougher to get over than others. But generally speaking, uh, you have to have a good sense of humor in life. You have, you have to approach things in a growth mindset as opposed to a fixed mindset. Um, I think it's a matter of, having the mindset of becoming, uh, not doing, but becoming. I think it's a, a matter of making it part of your personality. I mean, what you, th what you think about daily ultimately becomes your personality. So do you want to be a tough-minded optimist or do you want to jump on the negative train? I mean, that's, I don't know if that's a great answer. Uh, I don't know if you guys, I mean, if the rainbow rainbow nation over there in Aussie land over there <laughs> probably has a whole bunch of answers. I mean, look at that thing over there. How do you not smile? Look at Sandy. That's a great answer though. I love that. The mindset train, because I think in the moment you cannot see the humor. And then if you, sometimes you just have to call a friend who will help you find the humor. Sometimes you can just watch something funny, you know, and then you just I, immediately shift perspective. I will say this too, in regards to humor, it, it really does matter who you're hanging out with. Because if, if I hang out with five negative trainers, I'm going to be the sixth. If I hang out with five tough-minded optimists, I'm likely going to be the sixth. I mean, it's not written in stone, but you know, all of our kids, you know, kids don't like to hear this, but it really is true. You start assimilating to these, to the people you hang around with. I mean, I look at my own life. I, I'll just give, I'll give music, for example. Man, I didn't even know what eight, I, I didn't even know what the '80s music was. All my parents listened to were the '60s, and then in the '90s, I was like, "Wow, the '80s were pretty cool. That would have been cool to experience in the '80s." But and so I started listening to the '80s, and then I got into college, and I, I hung out with maybe the grungiest, dirtiest, foulest human being on the planet, and he was a punk rock band guy, maybe the worst voice I've ever heard. But I went to all his stuff, and I started appreciating punk rock music. I mean. And then I was forced to listen to country music, hated it. Now I'm a country diehard. So uh, we really do start to assimilate to the people we hang out with. And I would say that that would, that would help as well. Uh, I wanted to share, uh, Tressa made a comment. She said that um, Brad has been a huge positive light in her son's life. Mm. She has a pretty good, pretty cool little family. If you guys got five minutes to hang out with that cool cat, uh, her kids are definitely cooler than she is, but I like her as well. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> you know what? When I... Can, can, I use, uh... can I just say this super quick there, Sandy Nation? I want to talk about Tress. Uh, I know Tress probably wouldn't want me to make this about her, but... She is the 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 model of what it looks like. If 
you know her. She is always looking looking to invest. Like she's on here today and she's a phenomenal parent, but she's not going to get content with that. She's always investing. Like she is phenomenal. Her family is phenomenal. Uh, she's got two kiddos and she's on here looking to get better today. So anyway, Sandy, what you got, girl? I was just going to say, Tressa, my gosh, when our kids are cooler than us, then, you know, we know we've just thrown it up and knocked it right out of the park. Good on you. <laughs> Truth. <laughs> I, I don't want to just jump in, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, Ricky, Brad, Sandy, you guys are so freaking amazing. Thank you. Um, really, the takeaway from all three of you guys, seriously, just such good points from the heart. Um, in biology, you may have heard the term. Um, I had an ecotourism business in Maui for years, and I learned this from a biologist. You can determine the health of a pond by studying the frogs and that really really hit me when i learned that and i realized well what do you mean well they spend so much time in and around that pond encompassed in it that you can study their health to determine the health of the pond if they're sick the pond is sick if they're well usually the water they're in as well and it really made me realize and hearing you guys talk is your children are the frogs and you're the pond so just thank you for being present and mindful and really there. Just, you guys are awesome. Appreciate you. Thanks. I love that analogy, Jason. I just wanted to read one comment from Brian, all wisdom from all panelists to help early childhood educators to allow children to do risky play, like riding balance bikes on the play um, yard. Adults are the decision makers. Researchers from BC Outdoor Play Lab have cited playground advisors holding kids back and I think that you were saying that and Sandy it's like trust our kids be there to catch them but don't prevent them right don't prevent them from taking risks what do you think that's good that's good I would say too that you know there's a lot of all these I mean incredible strategies but you know for me relationships are king so if you want your relationship, if you want relationships with your kiddos to be king for you, the moment you hit the floor in the mornings, that has to be a priority. So all of your actions, all of your actions, I mean, you're trying to build a culture, right? It's, it's like building any other team. The moment they step into the room, the moment you see your kiddos, the moment you get into your day, you're trying to create a culture of awesome. And so that has to be the priority. Our actions, everything we do, we're building towards a desired identity. And so we have our core, core I call it having core values held loosely. I think you kind of hit on that just now, Karen. Like you let them roam, let them be themselves, let them become their own best version of themselves. But you have this core, like the core values, core, you know, gratitude and kindness and those things, those things are like, for me, non-negotiable habits that I want to instill in the people I care about. What You have to ask yourself, what are the non-negotiable habits that I want to instill in the people I care about the most? What is it I'm trying? What are we working towards? And then like the rest you said, like let them, you have to meet them where they're at. You have to meet them where they're at. Don't try to make them something they're not. Don't let them, don't try to make them star in someone else's movie. Let them be the star in their own movie. Let them create their own story. I, I wanted to add, um, so I, the book that I was in, um, I shared about my abuse story and um, I finally went public on Kauai, my island. Um, so the first 19 years of my life, um, I grew up with someone in close proximity who was an alcoholic and a drug addict drug dealer and incarcerated. And whenever um, that person was high or drunk was very violent. And um, for, for me, I had to get help um, to get therapy. Um, it, EDMR, like it, it was really hard guys. Um, but the one thing I told myself with my son is just letting him know that I loved him and I wanted to create a safe place for him. Um, Sometimes you won't know what to say to your child um, and that's okay. Um, sometimes just being present and listening and sometimes not even 
saying anything let them vent sometimes they just they just they just want to say the things they want to say um I used to get woken up um with pounding on the door you know like get up like that was how um my days were you know and and it's just because that person was you know that's that's what they thought was you know um good for kids but it wasn't you know because that person had to go to work before 6 a.m and wanted to ensure that we woke up and so I can't control my past but with my son um I wake him up sometimes with music and I start singing to the music (laughs) and then my son is like the opposite personality of me but you know what I feel like if I can encourage him and make him laugh first thing in the morning no matter what happens in his day, he's going to reflect upon how he started his day. And, and I think it's important for us to know the love language of our children. I'm a mushy, gushy person. My son isn't. And so as much as I want to hug him like a teddy bear because he's six feet tall, I'm five two, I don't because that doesn't make him feel loved. You know, he likes to eat and he likes to... Um, just be himself and so when I when I drop him off although I want to hug him I can't I'll just be like okay love you have a great day you're my favorite and I tap his arm or his leg and you know like it's simple but it, it it makes a difference and so all I can say is you can change and break the generational trauma that you've been on and and know that um you can't change yesterday tomorrow isn't even here and like um brad said you can slay the day today and so um your love does matter and i i feel like the people who've been on this panel and even the people in this room like just you being here inspires me because we can all make the world a better place just you know by making decisions that are positive so thanks thank you so much jesslyn and everyone here i think i mean this has exceeded my expectations. I think all of us, um, whether we're parents or not, I, I hope that some of these speakers have touched your soul that we really cannot, but like you, like you said, yes, like we cannot undo the past, no matter what you're going through now. I think all of us are here to say that there's hope, that it's never, no matter what challenge you're going through, that this too shall pass. And that was one of my, um, messages in the the gift of a failed suicide that we might think that this is the most horrible situation why did this happen to me and like um brad was saying the the pity city is real let yourself give yourself permission to sit in it and then you know know that you will rise above know that you will get through it thank you tressa highlight of her weekend I really feel so grateful. It's a Sunday. I know a lot of people are watching football or a lot of people have things to do. This will be available on replay. And I just really appreciate everyone who's um, here. Thank you, Ricky. Ricky came back. Hey, Ricky, any uh, like one minute closing? I think all the speakers, if you have time, just share like a one minute closing. We will start with, is Jason still here? We'll start with Jason. No, I just, like I said, I love the fact that you guys uh, really push unconditional love, being present and being mindful. And mindful isn't meditation. Mindful is understanding how my thoughts, feelings, and emotions don't only affect me, they affect everyone around me. Just like the frog in the pond, you know? So thank you guys. You're amazing. I, I appreciate all of this. I've learned so much. Thank you. Thank you. I love that pond. I'm going to remember that, that pond and frog analogy. I think all kids should know that. Ricky, Ricky's back. Any closing words, Ricky? Can't wait for the third parenting summit and <laughs> loved all of, loved all of the wisdom from all of you amazing speakers. And for those of you that are in the audience, each one of you has a story. So the next time we do have an event like this, your words are going to be just as powerful. I have heard Denise slight before I had to leave, I heard her in one of the summits that you guys hold as well. I can't wait to hear your story and the rest of the people in here from Lily, Tressa, Lori, Brenda, Ben, all of you guys, Brian. So thank you guys. We'll see you guys at the next summit. That's what I'm looking forward to. Thank you. Sandy, our Aussie queen. Are you here? Yeah. You know, Ricky absolutely nailed it. I really feel like your summit speakers for the third summit are here and present in this audience. I just, I love the people who are here with us today. And, you know, 
I want to say, oh yeah, unconditional love and be present and breathe and but no, 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 no. It's none of that. The takeaway from today has nothing to do with me, Jason, Brad, or Ricky. We all need to aspire to be Ricky's mom and be Mrs. LaCorte who shows up and who shows up and is simply present even in adulthood. And, you know, there's nothing better than that, than our kids then when they are grown, knowing that we let them fall, we let them learn, but we are just always there as that constant with that unconditional love and pride of just loving our kids because they exist and and they're creating an imprint on the planet with their presence. I love that. Unconditional I want to be Ricky's you. mom. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ricky's mama. I think I love that because when we have challenges, sometimes we wonder like, what am I thankful for? They're giving me stress. They're giving me frustration, but truly it should be, or maybe considered to be a, I think Jason said that like growth. It truly is, um, and even like Brad was saying, right? It's an opportunity for growth. So whenever we feel like, oh my gosh, why is this happening to me? Those words entered my mind through that. That's how mama's got to let go. It's based on a journal filled with um, just a lot of anxiety, chaos, fear, and just knowing that you're going to get through this. I think it's the bottom line that we all are going to get through this. And Brad, let's hear your final thoughts. Oh man, what an opportunity. If I could get a little bit of this infused into my diet every day, life would be extra good. Uh, no, I just want to thank, I want to thank the panelists. I want to thank all the, the peeps in the room for a, what an awesome opportunity, an awesome day. Like uh, Tress said, this, this makes, makes my weekend as well. And I would just encourage everybody to, yeah, give yourself grace. I think one of the other peeps talked about, give yourself grace. You're just going to wake up every day. Let your toes touch the floor, feel some gratitude, be the best version of you. And if you're sitting at a four, then be a hundred percent of that four, whatever it is, meet yourself where you're at, have a great relationship with yourself and let that spill over into the people that you love the most. So I, I appreciate you guys. Awesome. Awesome job today. Wow. What a powerful closing. I love that. If you're at a four, be, be it, embrace it, give yourself grace. I think that's what a lot of us are struggling with. I shouldn't be a four. I should be at a nine. I shouldn't be this. I should be that. So thank you so much for the reminder. Um, Jess, any closing words? I am so grateful for everyone who attended. Oh, I just wanted to say thank you so much. We are honored and privileged to um, provide these summits. She does the um, parenting summit and I host the healing summit. Uh, but if you guys want to be on a podcast or Karen has um, her own interview series, Ricky has his own interview series on YouTube. Brad has his own podcast. Um, please contact us. We're all on all social media platforms, all of us. And so if you guys want to connect with us, um, if you are in California or if you know someone who is in California, uh, we are going to do our first in-person workshop. It's an all-day workshop. Karen and Ricky and I are joining forces. Uh, Karen and I are leaving on the 15th. And we will be doing our first ever in-person workshop. So if you want to know more information, you can contact one of us and we can let you know. But um, it is called a reflection reunion. And we wanted to infuse it with a lot of aloha and inspiration and encouragement that, you know what? Yes, let's reflect and let's be inspired for today and 2023. So um, we, we would look forward to meeting you if you're there. I'm sorry, it's not virtual, it's in person. Um, but yeah, that's what I wanted to share. But thank you so much, guys. We, we're so happy to have and you. And also, Jess, Kawaii Shave Ice. Oh, yes. And we're okay. So when you attend, we're going to provide food and snacks and shave ice. <laughs> and if we could, we would have Elsa, but I'll make believe I'm the Moana in the group. Okay, guys. <laughs> But yeah, so we're, we're really excited. Um, we're also going to be meeting with crime survivors, um, people who have been impacted by crimes, families, and um, their nonprofit. We're going to be holding a, a toy drive um, at our event, and we're going to have a meet and greet to meet the people who serve the community in um, California. So yeah, thank you.
Thank you. Any final words from our attendees? Oh, there's a lot of lot in the chat. I Brian? love Moana. Kalua Pig. <laughs> oh, Brad is having a uh, webinar coming up in 11 days, so it's on Eventbrite. Um, Ricky can reach uh, Ricky Lacorte at yahoo.com. Thank you so much. I am just... And then Jason also has a six-week... Yes, Jason, real quick. Let them know about your six-week... Just it's true, I'm, I'm, a change I'm in your life kind of. I'm rewriting that right now. It was a live uh, workshop that I had that goes for six weeks, um, one hour per week. I just launched the first video last week, which is why you do what you do. And it goes over a lot of the domestication process that I talked about that really helps you understand your neural programming and how we picked up a lot of these crazy behaviors as a kid. You know, we wonder why we respond in certain ways. It really helps you realize that and rewire it. And it's a ton of fun. So please, please check it out. You can find it on my Instagram. Um, yeah, man, it's right there. And then as I rewrite them, I'm going to launch them one at a time. The reason I did it a week at a time is because humans tend to pick up another book as soon as they finished reading one book without implementing that information. And so when I do teachings like that, I try and give people a week to implement the information before they learn something new. Thank you. Yeah, Des and I watched it. It is amazing. It really uh -huh. makes you understand why, why we do what we do, why we, we think you touched on it. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday and oh, and the rest of your Monday, Sandy. And I look forward to next year. And like Des said, if you know anyone in California, send them our way. It's going to be on December nice. 17th. Take care, guys. Love you guys. Love you, everyone. Love you. Bye. bye. Thanks, Denise. <laughs> that was amazing, girl. You knocked it out of the park. Yeah. <laughs> right on. You guys are awesome. Sandy, I love you. It's so good to see you. Oh, but hey, I meant to I meant to incorporate Auntie No No into my um talk and just too many other things are happening and I had to sort of I wrap it up. It so fast, I know. <laughs> but it was exactly what I mean, isn't it amazing how much sorry. you can say and do? Sorry, you can stop recording. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so we can still talk and then I'll edit.